reminder today, we are having our lunch afterwards, directly afterwards. And uh, so we're excited to spend time together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And um, hopefully some new folks will be here that um, join in our fellowship. And just on that note, we're going to have another one in two weeks. It's going to be a spaghetti dinner. And Jeff asked me, yep, that slide right there. So it's going to be a pasta bar after church again, right after the service. Um, make sure that we actually show up for the service, and then we can all go down there and, and fellowship together. But we won't kick you out if you don't. But, you know, the goal is to meet together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And other announcements we have. Um, this week, uh, there's going to be a God sighting study still, I believe, yep, on Thursday. And that's uh, January 4th at 6 p.m. here at the church. And then men's basketball is on Saturdays at 9 a.m. to noon. So that's starting this Saturday. Um, we do have uh, Sylvia Zenius, one of our sisters here. Her son passed away. Uh, he had a long illness, and he passed away on December 26th. So Sylvia and family, our thoughts and prayers are with you uh, for the Lord's comfort through all this, these times ahead. Um, Men's Bible study, Sunday the 7th, is going to be at 6 p.m. here at the church. And then Sunday, January 21st at 6 p.m. And there is a women's fellowship meeting on January 16th which is a Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. So if you're able to attend that. Um, just making sure here. Um, there's a Cornerstone Sunday School class social event. So Denny, is that? Okay. So that's going to be on Saturday, January 13th at 5.30 p.m. at the Village Inn restaurant in Norton. So if you know where that's at, be there. Uh, it says bring a wrapped gift for a white element, right element, elephant gift exchange. And this should be something that you already have at your home. So you don't have to go out and buy something, but, you know, if you got an old something there, a knick-knack or whatever, wrap it up. It, it's, it's for fun. So come for the food, the fun, and the fellowship. And see Denny for the sign-up sheet if you plan on attending. Denny's over here. And we have large print issues of our daily bread, plus the regular ones are out there. So help yourself if it's, you want something to read through and do a devotional. And is there anything that I missed? Nobody's throwing anything. Okay. All right, and if there's nothing else, we will continue in worship. Let's continue to praise the Lord Jesus Christ this morning.
fist for Children's Church. We want to mingle around and greet each other. Today's scripture reading is going to be from 2 Corinthians, and we're going to be in chapter 5, and it's going to be chapter 5. So if you want to, if you have a pew Bible in front of you, it's going to be on page 142. Page 142 of the New Testament, if you have a pew Bible, if not, if you got your own, it's going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we were in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared for us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, always being of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your conscience. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they, may, they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, Yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin in our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for preserving this Bible for us throughout the generations, that we can know you. And Lord... Just bless Matt as he comes forth and, and proclaims the word of God to us. Holy Spirit, open up our hearts to what your message is for us. And Lord, we just ask for continued grace, which you promise, Lord. But we ask that your kingdom grow and that people that don't know you know you today. If there's someone here, Father, who is not saved, make today the day of salvation. And Lord, we, we will give you all the praise and glory. And it's your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Sally. That was beautiful. And uh, a couple of the songs here today, my dad would have loved. I just, my dad has, he led, led singing at our church for years and years, and just uh, there were some that I know he really appreciated, and they spoke to my heart here this morning. And uh, we're already in the vein of what God has for us and what God has to say to us today from his word, right? We have come for him, right, to hear from him, to worship him. We've come for word and for worship, and in the midst, we have the deepest fellowship that there is this side of heaven, right? And uh, it's just good to be with you again this morning. So I brought the rest of our gang this morning. I know my wife, Kristen, and the rest of the, and half of our kids weren't able to be here last time, but we're just grateful to be here and to be worshiping with you. And once again, it's just the uniqueness of brothers and sisters, the spirit between us, C.S. Lewis talks about the recognition of Christ in you and Christ in another. And there's a ministering that God uses and uh, does between brothers and sisters. Um, and I just already have sensed that here this morning as well. So as John read for us, uh, we are in 2 Corinthians and chapter 5. I'm doing two things this morning that I don't typically do. Uh, the first of which is attempt to tackle an entire chapter. Uh, that is not my M.O., to be honest with you, but the more I looked at this passage, the more I really hope to be able to draw a few key points out of this passage together for our day today, which is New Year's Eve, and for the year to come, and for the remainder of looking forward in our lives here on this earth. And then secondly, I don't like to get too, I don't even know what the word necessarily is, but you know, we're looking into a new year. We're looking into 2024, which my son Jackson said yesterday. He's like, I cannot believe that it's 2024, right? And he's saying that at the age of 14, and I'm saying that at the age of almost 40, going, yeah, buddy, I, I know. This is, this is unreal. We're, we're continuing, right, because time does march on. I want to approach this passage with a sense of looking forward. I do. Um, this is not simply a New Year's resolution sermon, so hopefully you can remove that from your minds. I think it's good for us to set our minds on things, but we're to set our minds on things above, right? Um, and I hope we can do that together as we look into a new year. So hope your Bibles are turned to 2 Corinthians 5. Let me pray uh, over this time and text, and then we will dive in together. Father, once again this morning, we are faced with a mystery. And it's not just a mystery that is unknown and unreachable and somehow out of our grasp. But no, this mystery is Christ. And as we have celebrated him uh, in these recent days, we celebrate him again this morning that he made himself known to us. Out of ivory palaces, he descended into a world of woe. And Father, as already has been mentioned this morning, this world of woe is a world that we see and face every day. Help us, through the truth of your word today, to know how, Lord, to wake up, to go out the door, and to face this world in the name of Jesus and with hope eternal. We pray this in your name. Amen. So if I were to title the sermon, and I didn't make it into the bulletin this week, because uh, I didn't get it to Mike soon enough, but I would title this, Tent Life and Reconciling the World. Tent Life and Reconciling the World. So for just a second, I want to talk to you about um, the camping journey for our family. Uh, when my wife and I were married, almost 17 years ago, we decided to register, of course, because it's great, right? You get a gun, not an actual gun. You get a nice barcode scanning gun, and you get to run around stores and act like it's Christmas because you know someone else is going to buy, hopefully, the things that you're scanning, right? So, of course, I think if I recall, Kristen was telling me, like, okay, okay, enough, right? I'm like, this is great. Let's... So I scanned a tent because I thought, well, we're going we're gonna to camp, you know? So I scanned a tent. And uh, it's, it was two-person, which if you know, actually it was a four-person. Because if you know anything about tents, when they say two people, it's like two sardines, right? Like smashed into the smallest like, space possible. 
So it was a four-person tent, which technically really should be for two. And we started our, our camping journey. We went with friends once down to Tappan, I think I remember, in, in that tent. And uh, it's an experience, isn't it? You know? I mean, have any of you, raise your, have you guys tent camped? Anybody? Oh, yeah. All right. Okay, this is good. So you know what I'm referencing when I speak of tent camping and then tent camping in the rain. Right? If there's one thing that can ruin camping while, while in a tent, it's rain. Especially if it just continues. Because that waterproof canvas is only going to last so long. And sure enough, that rain starts dripping and there's really not much you can do about it. So wet tent camping is about, oh, but I, yeah. So we then graduated beyond that, though. And at one point, we got a fifth wheel, kind of an old one. Then we got a nicer fifth wheel. And then we realized we couldn't afford that, so we sold it. But, but so we went from tent camping to glamping, and now we don't have anything at the moment. But um, Paul references tents. And this is, this is where we start in verse 1 of chapter 5. It's unique. He uses this analogy. He says, for we know that in the tent that is our earthly home, if our tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And just like Paul likes to do, he is using the tent analogy not for the building, right, that we are actually in. We're talking our actual bodies. He's referencing what it is to be on this earth, this side of the glory, in, yes, a sin-depraved world, and feeling those effects daily. Those effects daily. Because just prior in chapter 4, he speaks about not losing heart. Why? Because our outer self is, yes, wasting away. Wasting away. The reminder daily. Now, I played a little bit of basketball with my son yesterday, which we had a great time doing so, but my body was telling me that this morning when I tried to get out of bed, and I mean it. Um, I, I had to stretch in order to, like, get to the bathroom. It, it is, right, it's a reminder daily that we are in earthly bodies, tents, as Paul says. But he says, if this tent that is our earthly dwelling is destroyed We have a building from God, not a house made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan. Now, if you were with me just a few weeks ago when I was here, we discussed in Romans chapter 8 what it is that the Spirit is doing within us. Remember? That the Holy Spirit helps us. Why? Because we groan. Why? Because this is not our home. This is not our home. Our bodies know that this is not our eternal dwelling. It even spoke in, in Romans 8 about the earth groaning, right? Creation itself is waiting for the redemption of us. For the redemption of true creation to be in its eternal glory. So do you ever find tent camping something interesting, isn't it? Because you leave your house, you pack up a bunch of stuff that's kind of in your house, some, again, more than others, whether you're glamping or camping, and you head out and you go sit in practically a field. Maybe it's beside a lake. I, I particularly have to have water when I camp, to be honest, but you're okay, you're there, and then you all set up your temporary home, right? And you get it all together and you, have, you can wash your dishes and all these things, and you're hoping to take a shower at some point in time, right? But you're not home. You are in a temporary dwelling. And this is one of the first things that I'd like our hearts to hear this morning is that this is not your eternal home. I hope and pray that you know what it means to long for something greater than and other than this world. Christmas has just taken place. I pray that you received a gift at some point or from someone, and I'm sure it was wonderful. You appreciated that expression of love, and some of you really like to give gifts, right? Because that's your love language. And yet, (laughs) sorry, (laughs) I just got a look from Paula. I'm sorry, that's great. I was like, yes, yes, absolutely. And it's wonderful. It's an expression of love. But the problem is, is that gift will most likely be used, and maybe it will be used up. Or maybe it will become lackluster, or maybe it won't have as much right, thrill as, as it did. 
Because nothing of this earth can truly satisfy the deep longing of the soul for its creator. We must be reminded of this. So as we look into the new year, we look into what 2024 might bring, I want you to look at what tent life means for you spiritually. Yes, we have homes. Yes, we live in them. I'm not talking about where we're putting our physical body that is deteriorating and one day will be no more. I'm talking about our spiritual attitude, our spiritual walk as we wake up every day to understand that this world is not our home. There is a tension in our faith, brothers and sisters, a tension. This is the uniqueness because we have victory in Christ, amen? We have victory in Christ. He has gone to the cross, and in a moment we'll talk about that in reconciliation. We have victory in Christ, and yet we still feel the pain of sin, the destruction of death, the reality of death, which already was mentioned here that some of you this year have felt and know. And so we hold the truth of Christ in one hand and the truth of being in this world in the other. We already are in Christ and are not yet with him. This is the tension of our faith. But as we begin to think about tent life, what does this mean for your daily living? What does it mean to not put your hope and trust in things of this world? The psalmist says, we don't put our hope in chariots, we don't put our hope in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God, right? We do not put our hope in the things of this world. And so, we have hope. You have hope today. For those of you in Christ Jesus, you have a heavenly dwelling that is prepared for you. And when you die, when this body, right, that is failing us daily, right, day by day, some more than others, when we pass from this earth, we will know what it is to be in the newness of Christ. To be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord, Paul tells us. So if anything, this 2024, this year ahead of us, can be a year of hope living in the knowledge that we are not home. We put our hope in the heavenly dwelling that is waiting to be ours. For while we were still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, Paul says, this is verse 4, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up in life. And he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So, be of good courage. Do you ever find that the looking back, because at this time of year, right, we do a lot of looking maybe forward, maybe putting some things down, maybe saying this is what I intend to be or change or, right, something I'd like to accomplish. There's nothing wrong with that. But then we also do some looking back. Right? My Spotify on my phone tells me, here's what you listened to in 2023. And to be honest with you, I'm like, I don't really care. I just want to listen to my next podcast. But anyways, right? There's all these things. Looking back, here's what 2023 held. Problem is that sometimes nostalgia and looking back can cause us to see things with a silver lining that makes looking forward very negative. You know what I'm saying for a minute? Like, when we talk about days of old, I just had a conversation with a brother in the back, Jerry, and he just told me they do not make cars now like they used to. And it's true. That is true. He spoke truth, right? But this is what I'm talking about. We look back and say, oh, the days that once were. Oh, the things that were better then. I wish if we could only, right? Where are we now? And we get stuck in this negative nostalgia of looking back. And Paul is clearly telling us here, We are the ones to always be of good courage. Christians are to be ones living in hope, not in the negative nostalgia of what once was. And let me encourage you for a second. For those of you who remember a day when the church had more people in the pews, or remember a day when there was ministry vibrant in certain ways that you just loved, I had a pastor friend of mine who always told me, God is too creative to ever do the same thing twice. And I love it. I hold to that because he's right. 
because we can try to do what once was and go back to those things. But God is saying to you, behold, with this good courage, I want to do new things in the days to come. So we are in our tent dwelling, temporarily in this world, holding on to the hope of Christ, showing the world good courage. We can speak hope. And if we see a world that's in need, then it's a great time to be a believer. It's a great time to have Christ and show the world that he is there for them. So we are of good courage. Why? Because we walk by faith, not by sight. And now I know that this is, I'm not going to park here for very long because I know we could sit on this and this has many coffee cups, many coffee cups and signs that have this written, written on it, which is fine. It's a good thing. Um, we truly do, though, have a hope that is in a faith of a child that was born 2,000 years ago who went to a cross and then rose again for our life. I just read this past week that Jesus said, blessed are those who believe and do not see, right? And then he said, Father, as he prayed in John 16, Father, I pray you will bless those who believe by their message, by the disciples' message. We have believed by the message of those who have gone before. And Jesus spoke of us. We hold to this hope and we are of good courage, right? Now, we walk by this faith. We are of good courage. We long for a new day, a new day with a new body. But what will take place when we do pass from this earth? Well, Paul says it. We will all stand before the Lord. Stand before the Lord. Look right there. For we must all, verse 10, this is verse 10 of chapter 5, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, if you were to read that verse strictly outside of the rest of Scripture, then you might begin to think that we, we serve a God who has a works-based you know, judgment, a works-based faith. And this is something I encourage you to do as you read your Scripture, is let Scripture speak to Scripture. If you're in the midst of a passage and it sounds as if it doesn't make sense according to other passages, then open up the context. See what it says, Right? This is something in, in my school that we, we learned. It's, it, there's a Latin term for it, but scripture can help interpret scripture. Mind you, this is how the actual books in this Bible came to be. Because if a book came along, Gospel of Thomas, and it didn't abide by the remainder of the, the other portions of scripture, then it was not seen to be fit to be in this word. You can trust it. Okay, side note. However, we will stand before the Lord in judgment to answer for the good or the evil that we have done. Why would this be good news for us this morning? To stand before a holy God? Well, for that we need to, in my Bible, turn the page, but we need to go to verse 11 and following, right? Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. For we are not commending ourselves to you again, but we're giving you cause to boast about us so that you may, be, you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. This is why it's hard to go through an entire chapter. There's this small chunk here that I'm going to go through in a second, and then we'll talk about reconciliation. Paul was facing accusation. So the church of Corinth, we all know, was in a bit of a mess. We know this, we all say this, right? You read 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, you see the things that were taking place, right? I mean, people, it seemed like their meetings were even in chaos. People were giving prophecies. People were speaking in tongues. Other people weren't translating that, those tongues. There were people that, I mean, it was, it was a mess, just like we all are, by the way. But there were those who looked at Paul and said that he was peddling the gospel for his own gain. They said that he was using the gospel so that he could promote himself and make money off of it. Problem was, Paul wasn't doing this. They were. They even wrote letters that spoke against Paul. And Paul is pleading with those in Corinth, and he's saying to them, I am attempting to show you Jesus Christ and his reconciliation and nothing more. It's unique that Paul uses the analogy of tents because what was Paul's job? Tent maker, right? In fact, 
that's how he ended up in Corinth. When he ended up in Corinth, he met Priscilla and Aquila, right? Aquila and Priscilla. And they also were tent makers. So they hung together for a while because they knew what it was to make a temporary dwelling. So interesting, right? So Paul even worked among them so that he could sell things to feed himself but just preach them the gospel. This is the beauty of it, because Paul's trying to say to them, I don't want anything from this other than you knowing Christ Jesus as your Lord. There's a beauty here. So that's kind of the side note of that chunk there when he says, look, there are those who are speaking against me, and I don't want them to, um, I don't want you to think that I'm somehow trying to gain from this gospel, right? Okay, that's a side note to it all. Um, verse 14. Paul says, for the love of Christ compels us or controls us. I have ESV that I'm reading out of this morning in verse 14. Mine says, for the love of Christ controls us. Does anybody else have a different word there? Compels, right? That's what I thought. And is that KJV or New King James? Do you know? NIV. Oh, NIV says compel. Okay, yes. The love of Christ compels us, right? For one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Because your question might be, be this morning, so Matt, I understand that I am in a body that is failing. I understand that I am a t- in a tent, in a dwelling that is temporary and not for this world. Right? I understand that there is a just God and I will stand before him someday. But what on earth is my motivation? That can be the question, right? You want to set forth some things in the new year? The question is why? Well, maybe for some of you, you have some health concerns, and therefore you know you need to focus on your health, and there's your motivation. I want my body to be healthier. I want to live as long as I can to be with my family, to be with brothers and sisters, so I'm going to work on my physical health. There's my motivation, right? Paul says that his motivation is one thing. It is the love of of Christ. The love of Christ. And here's where we get to this final and kind of summit of this passage, but I want to talk about reconciliation. Jesus Christ left equality with God. The ivory palaces that we sang about. He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he lessened himself, he lowered himself, he humbled himself, descended, right? Not just as a man, but as a child, a helpless baby to be taken care of, to be fed, to be changed, to learn how to speak, to learn how to walk, to know what it is to skin his knee, right? To grow up just like you and me. And he did so without sin. The sinless Savior, this chapter is going to end on it. The sinless Savior raised by Mary and Joseph then chose to go to the cross for you and for me. In fact, for the entire world. Why? Because if you and I were to stand before a just God and have to answer for the right and the wrong that we did in our lives, none of us none of us could stay in the presence of a holy God. In fact, so much so that Romans says that sin is death. We know it. This is what we're speaking on. But the wages of sin is death, and we deserve it. To sin is to be separated from a holy God. And the the trajectory of your life is death. But God right? But God sent his son. He knew that you and I could not meet his standard of righteousness. Therefore, he said, I want my creation to be reconciled with me. What does this mean? I want my creation to have a right relationship with me. You know what this means. Some of you know what it means to have a reconciled relationship because maybe there was a time in which you did something against someone that you know and love, or they did something to you And words had to be exchanged and forgiveness had to be given, right? And then there was 
a reconciled relationship. It's a beautiful feeling. Some of you might be still waiting for that day in some of your relationships. I'm telling you today that Jesus Christ is able to reconcile you to your creator. And brothers and sisters, I pray this truth is known in your heart and in your life. Because that is the starting point of life. Jesus Christ came. He didn't come for those who already had it together. He came for the sick. He came for the poor. He came for the needy. He came for me and you. And he gave us his life. But see, he died on a cross for sin, for all the sins of the world. And then he rose again, right? He defeated this death. This is how we can look at death in these bodies. This is how in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul can say, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Because Jesus has defeated death. Amen? Amen. And this is the life of reconciliation we now get to live. Paul is compelled by the love of Christ. I get up in the morning because I have a job. I get up in the morning because I need to help take care of my children, even though my wife does that much more than I do. I need to get up. Why? Because the love of Christ compels me on to the hope of glory, not only for my life, but for the life of every person I speak to each and every day. From now on, therefore, verse 16. This, is us, this, is this, this little section here, we're going to land the plane on this alone. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. That statement alone could be an entire sermon in itself. We regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is passed away. Behold, the new has come. What does it mean to not regard anyone according to the flesh? Do you ever size somebody up the first time you meet them? Do you ever make a judgment call on somebody after they walk in the door? You've looked them up and down. You've made your assessment. You know who they are, what they're about, right? <laughs> yeah, we do it all the time. We regard other people according to the flesh. We see what their job is. We see how accomplished they are. We see how much money they have. We see the car that they drive. We see the house that they live in. We see if we want to be with friends with them or if we don't. There's certain aspects of our culture that we never grow up from, right? Junior high and high school seemingly continue to exist. Do they not? Because we regard other people solely by what is seen and according to the flesh. But Paul says, no, 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 no. Not the same for the believer. If you are in Christ, and if you are a new creation, then you now have had your eyes open to the spiritual realities. When someone walks in the door, now you're not seeing them as an accomplished or an unaccomplished person, a well-dressed or a not well-dressed person, right? Somebody you want to be friends with or not. Those things dissipate because you see them as an eternal soul in need of a savior. There's the new perspective. There's the waking up in the hope of glory, compelled by the love of Christ, to speak to someone that maybe you never would have spoken to before. This is the openness and the gentleness and the beauty of the gospel for the church. This is what the church is to be, and this is what I see you being. This is the welcomeness that I see you, opening up your doors, right? Having food for people today even, just bringing them in because we want to get to know you speak to you, let you know who Jesus Christ is. And so, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What is reconciliation? Verse 19. Keep, just stick with me here for these last three verses. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. 
We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I know we just went through so much, and I want to encourage you to utilize this passage maybe in your studies this week as you go through your devotions or open up your Bible early in the morning, late at night, sometime in the afternoon, on your lunch break, whatever it might be. Because God made Christ sin who knew no sin so that we could be reconciled to him. But then what does he tell you to do? This isn't the get out of jail free card, believer. This isn't just, well, I'm in. I signed the, I signed the card. I signed the back of the book, the Bible, the front of my Bible, whatever it might be. No, that is the beginning of a life of ministry. The person that stands here behind this pulpit, the elders of this church that lead forward and show the spiritual path and care for this congregation are not the only ones called to ministry, church. You have been called to a ministry of reconciliation. And so this life we live, this 2024, be it, let's look into this new year ahead. I'm just living in my temporary home, holding material things loosely before a world who wants to grasp them tightly. And in doing so, I want to look at the world around me to show the love of Christ who took their sin and my sin to the cross, defeated death, so that now I get to be a minister of reconciliation. Did you catch those very key words? That as ambassadors, God is making his appeal through you. It's not that he's just making his appeal through you, believer. He's calling you to reconcile the world to him. This is our charge. This is our goal, and Christ compels us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth this morning. I pray that you will just sink this deeply into our hearts. Lord, we struggle <laughs> this side of glory, not just in our own physical bodies, in our ailments and pain, Lord, but we struggle in greed. We struggle in lust. We struggle in gluttony. We struggle in wanting to, to have what the things of the world just hold so high. Help us, Lord, to see them for what they are. Empty. Empty and no promise. Show us the glory of Jesus this day. And as we wake up in days to come, that we would be compelled by the fact that Jesus loved us enough to die for us. Lord, we want to do your work, and we want to be ministers of reconciliation. May we do that today and in the days to come. We love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your name. Amen.
just want to thank uh, Matt again for such a great message. I, I jotted a lot of notes down. And um, the past few times I've given the benediction, I've been reading what I know my sister sang and I sang in New Horizons. It's um, at the end of Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. And the peace that God offers, you know, sometimes it's going to rain and your tent's going to get wet. It, it just is. Uh, Paul and I were talking about this. Sometimes we in the Christian circles make it out to be that once you're saved, everything gets good. Right. <laughs> just look at the lives of the apostles. Look at John the Baptist. Look at Christ himself. He begged his father, take this cup from me. If there's any other way, please, and there wasn't. So it may rain on your tent, water may get in there, but the Lord is going to give you peace. And the peace comes from what Matt was talking about, that this isn't our home. And not to have Sermon 2.0, but I, I was, we were really blessed by his message. Thank you. So let's go to God in prayer, and I'll, I'll pray for our, our fellowship down there. If you're able to stay, come on down, and we'd love to, to fellowship together, break bread together. And um, let's, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for what you've done. And Lord, uh, if it's raining on someone right now, Father, give them the peace that only you can give. Because, Lord, the, the world should look at us as sinful people that go through hardship as well and say, how are they holding it together? Um, Lord, it's through your peace. It's the only the peace that you can offer. And just knowing that we do look forward to the heavenly home that you have gone to prepare for us. And Lord, help us to be great stewards of what you give us here on earth, but at the same time, help us to be willing to give everything back, if that's what you require. Lord, give us the, the heart that is willing. And the Apostle Paul said, Father, that if I do all these great things, but I don't love, it's worthless. So Lord, drill into our hearts with the Holy Spirit and help us to love those that the world doesn't. And Lord, help us to give you all the praise and glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen.